You've tuned in to Unpause Your Life with Dr. Kelly Estes. Your access to success strategies and more to help you move onward and upward with your life. Listen in each week as she interviews others who have really taken their essence to the next level and truly unpause their life. Now here's your host, Dr. Kelly Estes. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. This is Dr. Kelly Estes and I am founder of the Addictions Academy the Addictions Coach, and Rehab Rescue. Welcome to Unpause Your Life. This is a great podcast where we showcase people who have done something extraordinary with their life. I welcome you and I hope you enjoy all of our guests. On my way found a reason to wake up another day. Before we get started, let's hear this short message from one of my supporters. Did you know 81% of Americans would like to become a published author? Chances are you might be one of them. What's stopping you? Writing and publishing a book takes a lot of work and is expensive, right? Well, not anymore. For your next book project, or even your first, team up with Hassle-Free Books. They make it so easy to become an author. They remove all of the fuss and struggle and make it smooth and simple. And it's far more affordable than you could ever imagine. Go to hasslefreebooks.com and use promo code UNPAUSE to receive a 10% discount off of any book project. Get started right away and become a published author in as little as 45 days. For your free one-hour book formula guide, which will show you just how painless it can be to become an author, head to hasslefreebooks.com today. All right. Thanks again for joining me. Let's get started with today's show. Took a walk down the dark road where they said that I shouldn't go. I knew the dangers of life. Welcome to Unpause Your Life with Dr. Kelly Estes, the Addictions Coach in the Addictions Academy. My next guest is Mara Shapshe, and she is an award winning writer, mental health awareness activist, baker, and comedian. She received her BFA in directing from NYU Tech School of the Arts. Her short documentary, The Sound of Silence, was showcased in the NYU Film Festival. In 2005, she had bottom and checked into rehab. Upon leaving rehab, she was fired from her job, going through a divorce, and was homeless. Carrie Fisher took her in. While living with Princess Leia, she wrote the novel Junkie American Princess. In 2008, she became a stand-up comic, and she performs regularly at the comedy store The Improv, Laugh Factory, and many other venues. When Carrie Fisher died in 2016, she decided to write an article for the LA Magazine about the relationship. The article resulted in her working for mental health organizations, including continuing on Carrie's work. Welcome, Mara Shapshe. So how are you today? Welcome to the show. Great. It's great. Thanks for having me. Sure. So tell me this. Everyone's going to ask, what was it like being Carrie Fisher's friend? It was wacky. It was awesome. It was uh, exciting, eccentric. We were like, she was my soul sister. We had the same kind of wacky brain. You know, we had both had mental illness and addiction and both writers and comedians and our brains thought similarly. So we were instant like soulmates, I think. So now that just gave me images of the two of you climbing out of a window somewhere and and being crazy and wacky. Well, what she'd like to do is she would wake me up at like three o'clock in the morning. We would garden or we would like chain smoke and eat ice cream and watch old movies in her bed. Like one time she woke me up and was like, "Okay, let's go burn some records. I'm like, "Okay, that seems (laughs) normal. That's crazy. That's like the, like you guys got into trouble, but not really. Like you did crazy, but still controlled things. Yeah. She just was very eccentric (laughs) and I'm down for anything and I'm not like normal either. So it's, it was always interesting. We're like, let's go skinny dipping at two o'clock in the morning. And it just was, it was amazing. It was just fun. That's awesome. So now tell me about this nonprofit. 
that you're you're running and you're in charge of? I'm not in charge of it. What happened is that I I wrote an article for LA Magazine, as you said before, and it was a deeply personal essay about Carrie. She died on my birthday, and it was like like the rug was pulled out from underneath me, and I felt such grief and loss. I mean, she was so important to me in my early sobriety. She saved my life. If it wasn't for her, I would be dead. The group, the A group that I was in took me off my medication and I was crazy, like suicidal. And and she literally talked me off a ledge. And so when she died, I just, I lost it. And I, I wanted the world to know just how special she was and just what a great person and caring and loving and kind person she was. And so I wrote the article for LA magazine and it went viral. And then out of the blue, these like mental health organizations contacted me because in the article I talked about both having mental illness and struggling with the with addiction. Uh, I'm sober t- over 12 years now, but Carrie struggled more with her, with her illness. I think, you know, I think she self-medicated a lot and and people don't understand how difficult it is to have bipolar and be an addict at the same time. It's, and her disease, both diseases were progressing. So it, it didn't surprise me. I had a, like a premonition like a week before that something was going to happen. I know it sounds weird, but I did, but I wrote that article and it went viral. And this is my brave uh, organization of mental health organization contacted me and said, will you produce one of our shows? And then the depressed cake shop, because I'm also a baker, contacted me and said, you know, will you bake some depressed baked goods for the show? And so I I hooked up with depressed cake shop and with This Is My Brave and just became like an instant, can you help us and get the word out there to end the stigma against mental illness and addiction. I was like, for Carrie, I would do anything. And then the Iraq Foundation contacted me and, and there were many other organizations and I I try to, to do as much work for all of them as I can. But I'm producing a show and hosting, doing stand-up November 7th, which you are in, which is great. I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be fun. Yeah. It's going to be great. It's at the Comedy Store and I'm covering the basis for because I'm one of the few that talks about dual diagnosis. It's usually like you talk about mental health or you talk about addiction and there's never like they don't come together in a way that they they should. Because a lot of most people, I think, in in the program have both. Right. You know, for me, I was self-medicating. And for Carrie, she was self-medicating. So it's, it's something we need to talk about and all these suicides that are happening, too. You know, we're not dealing with mental health and addiction together. And so there are very few organizations, if any, that do that. And so that's what my platform is. Well, you're right. Um, And as a therapist with 21 years in the industry, we're either trained in addiction or we're trained in mental health. We're not dually trained. There's no track for us to go to to be a mental health therapist and a drug and alcohol therapist. So you pick a track. And then what happens is you get thrown in one of these jobs at a treatment center and you don't have the skill set to handle the second part. So only half of your job gets done. Exactly. I work with Sen- with the Senate and Congress and I go to all these mental health, you know, events and they talk about mental health and there's no addiction being mentioned or like it's mentioned just like very shortly. And it's really need to, for this to come together. So I think we're looking at, you know, some reform in laws, you know, and some, you know, awareness for both things to come together. And so that's what I'm working on with Senate and Congress. That's excellent because different states have different rules too. Certain states have qualifications that you get state licensed as a mental health practitioner. And then when it comes to addiction, it's the wild, wild west. For example, Florida. If you want to be mental health, you have to get licensed by the state. But if you just want to do addiction, there's really, you know, just a, just a test. That's You just take a test and boop, you're certified. Wow. So it's so unregulated and it's so diverse that we can't even agree upon, you know, what the requirements are for the care, let alone give good care. So you're seeing that on the back end and I see it on the front end. Yeah. And the healthcare bill is, you know, the new one that just did, that didn't pass is 
similar to that. Like each state would decide and it's, it's too like willy nilly. There needs to be, you know, reform across the board. Right. Exactly. And there needs to be true treatment where you go in and you get mental health and you get addiction and we, you know, lower the stigma because for some people it's not okay to be a drug addict, but it's okay to have bipolar and then vice versa. It's okay to be a drug addict, but God forbid you have bipolar or borderline or schizophrenia, then you're crazy or cuckoo. So we have right. such bad stigma as a society that you can't have one and God forbid you have both. You know, you're just a mess. So yeah, we really have to bring attention to it and really, you know, bring the stigma on it down. And you're doing fantastic work to do that. Yeah, I'm trying really hard. Um, you know, with my day job and everything else that I do, it's, it's a lot of work. And I, I think this show will be, I think it'll be successful. You know, I think and I would like to to do more shows and festivals and books and, and, you know, just everything I can. It means so much to me to keep Carrie's name alive, to keep her legacy alive. And she really fought for ending the stigma against mental illness and addiction. And she she worked with many organizations and she and she really this was her cause. So and I don't want her name to die out. And I don't think it will because of Star Wars ever. But. I don't want her, her death to be in vain. Now, she was one of the few celebrities that actually brought attention to mental illness, not just addiction, yeah. but she put herself out there. Now, yeah, she was not afraid to, to, to show her bipolar and to, and to say, you know what, I'm, I'm mentally ill. And because I'm saying this, you can say it too. Right. And that's, that's rare to have somebody at that level say, I don't care if you don't accept me. This is what what's happening. And I want you to become aware of it. Now, with you picking up where she left off, have you had any pushback or any issues at all? Or has everyone been very supportive? For the most part, people have been supportive. I think it's a matter of like, I, I get a lot of people saying like, well, I would rather admit that I'm an addict than that than I have mental illness. Like they're still very ashamed of it. Mm-hmm. What was your personal battle with? I know about the, you had a food addiction battle. What was that like, trying to be in the limelight and be a comedian and be up there and go through this stuff? Well, I, I've had an anxiety disorder since I was little and depression. The anxiety was like agoraphobia. I mean, I've been to every single therapist imaginable, done exposure therapy, done this therapy, done that therapy. You know, I went to see Kim Basinger's <laughs> doctor. I was like, it's just something that's plagued me my whole life. You know, I... And I've been on every medication imaginable. I'm not on any medication now, but because I, I find that in the program, you know, dealing with things spiritually is, is the best bet for me. I don't like to throw a, a drug. You know, I don't like to think that a pill can fix everything. Tell me about that. But, what did you do for your personal recovery? How did you basically slay the dragon? What did you do? Well, I did go to therapy. Um, and I, I threw myself into Alcoholics Anonymous and I threw myself into any sort of recovery, spiritual recovery. So, you know, like the big book ends in one way, you know, spiritual awakening. And I was really looking for that. And Eckhart Tolle, like I would listen to Power of Now nonstop. It's a matter of like mindfulness, it's study Buddhism, Judaism. Like I, I just... I'm a seeker. So I, I sought out every single avenue in order for me to like, to be a more um, grounded, God-centered person. Because says in the third step, you know, we're, you know, we turn our will and our life over to the care of God. And I had to really do that. And, and what really got me there was when I was struggling with infertility. And I had to learn how to really trust God. It's very hard easy to have faith, but it's very hard to have trust. So that has been like the pivotal moment in my sobriety and that I can trust God, not know that my life, you know, take my hands off my own life and back away from it and let a higher power in really just did the, did the trick, but it took a lot of seeking to get there, you know, and because I struggle from a lot of outside issues, which is like eating disorders, anxiety, depression. You know, I had lots of food issues about around, you know, 
my self-worth. So it was like a lot of things I had to deal with. And, and I had to deal with it both in the spiritual realm and then in like therapy. And the two together, you know, caused a sort of like spiritual awakening. So you're what I like to call a seeker. You're someone who said, okay, this is a set of guidelines by which I'm supposed to live my life, but it's not enough. There's got to be more. And you investigated everything you could find and you picked the pieces that worked for you. And you said, this is going to work for me. That's rare. With people getting sober, they don't want to do that kind of work. They want someone to hand them a bunch of papers and say, this is what you need to do. Just, you know, follow this plan. Very similar to a diet. You know, if you eat this, 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 and this, you'll be fine. And a lot of people get in that rut and it doesn't happen fast enough. So you actually put the work into getting where you are today. Now, do you have people ask you how you got from where you were to where you are? Yeah. I mean, I've done a lot of podcasts. I've done a lot of, you know, I get asked to speak a lot. It's, I think it starts off as a wheat program. You know, we're going to a lot of meetings, we're doing fellowship and then it, it turns into an eye program. It turns into a, a seeking program. You've got to go off and, and find your, you know, your true connection to your higher power. When I sponsor, that's how I sponsor. It's like, okay, well, let's get you closer to a relationship with your higher power. Because that is the most important relationship you're going to have in your life. I don't think a lot of people really get the God thing, really get the higher power thing. They rely on the fellowship. They rely on other stuff. And and that's why you don't see a lot of success. But the people that I look up to in the program, the people in recovery, are the ones that have that deep spiritual connection, that, that conscious contact. Now, you work with a lot of comedians and I'm sure musicians and actors and such, how rampant would you say the epidemic of drug addiction is at the moment? It's huge. Everyone I know is in the program and I I work at it. My day job is at an entertainment law firm and we represent everybody. And there's so many people who are struggling or new in sobriety, so many clients and it's rampant. I mean, it's, I think the kind of lifestyle as a musician, like that's just what it, sex, drugs and rock and roll comedian is kind of the same thing. And I think as a creative person, having like a very busy brain like that is a creative brain kind of lends itself to drugs and alcohol and, and that kind of lifestyle more than let's say like a accountant or something like that. Then you've got to deal with the public. So if you have a bad performance or you get a bad rating or, you know, there's a bad picture of you in the press, you've got to deal with that, too. So then you have people, you know, saying negative things, negative reviews, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I had one client, famous actress, that they simply took a picture of her. She was coming out of a venue and it was not a flattering photo. And she wasn't drunk. She wasn't high. She was sober. And they wrote, oh, my God, she's gained weight. That was the exact the the headline. And she called me in tears and she goes, I haven't gained a pound. I've been the same weight for the past five years. But the photo, the way they shot the photo and what she was wearing really made her look heavy. And she was in tears and she's like, I just want to drink and I want to eat and I'm a mess. So I had to talk her off the ledge. So you also have that other pressure that, say, the average or normal person who goes to work and comes home doesn't have. Yeah, no, that's the kind of pressure. I mean, I remember Carrie and I went to William Shatner roast. Mm -hmm. They sat us up front. I was like, oh, no, they're going to go after Carrie. And they did. Yeah. And they went after her weight. They went after how she looked. I know, like, Pat, it was a funny joke, but it was so mean. But Pat and Oswald was like, Carrie Fisher's here, everybody. What happened to you, Carrie? Did you lose, you know, a Percocet Percocet eating contest with Chewbacca? Oh. And, like, Everyone's laughing, and I look at Carrie, and she's like, "No, it was Vicodin," you know. And and I was like, and we got home later, and she was crushed. She was like, "Do I look fat? Do I look fit?" You know. And I'm like, I "Cannot listen to these people. It's like none of your business what other people think or say about you." I was watching the Justin Bieber roast, and um, another roast, and I saw they had Courtney Love on, and they did the same thing to her. They made fun of her makeup, her weight, her hair, her addiction. 
And she just rolled with it. She just, you know, she was sitting upside down in the chair and she just figured at this point, might as well, they're already there. I might as well just continue the progression of it. Yeah, they roll with it. But then when they get home, it's not that way. <laughs> it yeah. Hurts. yeah, it does. It does. And I, I get those calls of desperation. So how do you deal with that? How do you handle that in your personal life and your circle? Is that something, do you guys talk about it? Do you call each other? Do you have a support system? What do you do? I have a very strong support system, but I've also stopped reading comments about myself. I went through a very public lawsuit against Jenny Craig, (laughs) and I was on TMZ, People Magazine, USA Today, The Today Show, and it was, they were going after me. I literally like hid under my desk for a few days. (laughs) I I was so like horrified, but then I was like, you know what? Own it. Just don't shy away from it. And people are going to say the meanest things about you and you just have to let it like, there's a bigger purpose here. You know, I was like, there's a bigger purpose for what's going on. Don't read the comments. Don't pay attention to what the press is saying about you. Just go on and, and know what your purpose is in life and not get bogged down by what other people say. There's always going to be people like that. And those are the people who aren't doing this, aren't putting themselves out there, aren't doing anything important with their lives. So they have to knock down everybody else. So I have to kind of see like, okay, why is this happening? Why are they doing this? This is their job. And I have to be strong enough to, to make it past that. I call those people keyboard commandos. It's easy to sit behind your keyboard and write something while you're eating a donut and right. saying that somebody else is fat or using drugs or look, looking you know, not their best. It's easy to do that. It's hard to actually go out there and be in front of people and do what that person can do. So I commend you for that. I mean, that's hard work. Yeah. I mean, as my... One of my sponsors says, like, you know, the harder the road, the higher the purpose. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like if your road is tough, you know that you're meant to do something <laughs> pretty, pretty extraordinary in this world. That brings us right into your second career. Your first career, you know, as a comedian and doing all of that. Now you're this huge spokesperson. Tell me more about this organization and tell me what you have going on November 7th. The organization we're doing the um, event for is called This Is My Brave, and their mental health and addiction awareness. This is their biggest show that they've done so far. Usually they do shows in like Boston and, and New York and, you know, D.C. And, and, you know, Iowa. And they have people with mental illness and addiction talk about their stories. And so since they asked me to do the show in LA, I was like, well, I want to do it. Like I do my other shows, which is like, you know, these kind of big shows with comedians and music. And I've been doing variety shows for a while now. We have some really great comedians who have bipolar, who struggle with addiction, uh, who are sober. We have musicians at rock to recovery guys. They're going to be performing. They're members of corn and slipknot. They're going to be doing a Chester Bennington and Chris Cornell tribute. And then we have, I can't say who it is yet, but we have a very uh, big comedian who's on TV right now. And he's, he's got OCD. He's going to be doing some stand up about that. We've got Jerry Quickly, who is a radio show host and who's a poet and fantastic poet. We've got just people who, who really have a good voice in this area, talk about their mental illness, you know, do jokes about it. And I'm going to do jokes about it. And, and you're on it too. We're talking about mental illness and addiction. I think it's just very important that we, we raise our voices and and end the stigma. And so the show is uh, November 7th, the comedy store at 8 PM. The tickets are $20, 25 at the door. I don't know the link off hand, but I um, get that. We'll post it up for everybody. Yeah. And uh, it's going to be great. I mean, there's music, there's comedy, there's poetry, there's, you know, it's, it's going to be an interesting, great show. You know, we've got uh, a lot of VIPs coming. We've got some senators, some congressmen. It's going to be really great. It sounds awesome. It's, It's so nice to see people really bringing awareness to this. When I think when Robin Williams started first talking about his, you know, years ago, people were like, oh, you know, something really wrong with him. And then Jim Carrey came forward and talked about his. And little bit by little bit, there were, you know, it was always the comedians that would say, 
tough work, you know, but a lot of our, our body of our work comes from our mental illness. And the one thing I noticed as I watched, there's a lot of trauma in people's backgrounds and they yeah. start talking about it. And little bit by little bit as a society, we have said, it's okay to have mental illness. These people on TV are just like me sitting on my sofa because we idolize stars and we idolize celebrities and say they couldn't possibly have anything wrong with them. They're on my television. And then you go, oh my God, she's bipolar and I'm bipolar. Wow. And she's still up there on my TV, which is amazing because you're working through major hurdles. So I think having a benefit like this, where there are people in the industry that support each other, bringing awareness to this is fantastic. Yeah, that's that's what I do. And I think like next year I'll do a festival. I mean, there's just so many things that, you know, I just really just want to get the word out there. Because I, I, as I told you before, like I'm writing a book now um, of essays and interviews of celebrities with mental illness that'll go along with the shows and get the word out there and get people to start talking about it and, and say, you know what, hey, I can talk about it too. And, and let's end the stigma. That's fantastic. And as you progress along with that, I'd like to have you back on and we can talk more about the stories, like the behind the scenes stuff that people don't generally see the nitty gritty of mental illness. You know, I'm a food addict first, pill addict, secondary, but I was raised in a house of mental illness. My father is severe bipolar, severe. My grandmother was borderline. So it was crazy. And I remember constant arguing and crying and my dad pointing a gun at me and putting a gun at himself. And I remember all that. And I think once you get into those stories, I'd like to talk more, not necessarily whose story it is, but that actual story, the, the trials and tribulations someone goes through with mental illness and how they come out the other side swinging and winning. Because that's so important. Yeah. And you can, I mean, and recovery is possible no matter what the trauma is. That's what I want to say too. Like, it seems like, well, I, all of this stuff has happened to me. I've been sexually abused. I've been, you know, incest or, or all of these things that happened to me. How do I recover? I can never, like, I can never be the same or I can never be recovered. And I, I'm here to tell you that you can, you know, anything is possible. So we can't get bogged down in all the, you know, trauma of it. Like really have to like tell your story, get it out there that it helps other people tell their story. That's what this, this is my brave is all about. You know, tell your story. It's okay. And we don't have to be ashamed of it and we can recover from it. That's fantastic. So how can everyone find you? Where can they find you and your message if they want to connect? Uh, they can go to my website, marishapshay.com. And where would they find uh, the, the event I'm going to post for us for November 7th so that they can access that directly. Yes. I'll put it on my, on my website. I'll Facebook and I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Mara Shapshe or, or um, at uh, M Shapshe comic Baker. Okay, perfect. And we'll include all your links for everybody to, to see as well. So they can reach out to you about the bakery and about the event and of course supporting supporting the nonprofit and helping you get the message out there. Yeah, I do bake uh, mental health awareness bake goods <laughs> too. <laughs> That's the business that I'm starting, but it's a uh, it's the book is taking precedent over that, but I do uh, make, you know, schizophrenic snickerdoodles and uh, bipolar cookies and therapy couch cupcakes all to, to raise money for uh, mental health organizations. That's so neat. That's so unique. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate you taking time out of your day. I know you're super busy. Yeah, well, I'm recovering from surgery right now. so <laughs> <laughs> I caught you at the right time. Exactly. Well, thank you again, everyone. That was Mara Shapshe, and I'll put all the links up so you can reach her. And this is Callie Estes with unpauseyourlife.com. Hey everyone, thanks again for listening. I really hope you enjoyed the show today. Head on over to iTunes and Apple Podcasts and leave a comment or review of what you think. Or contact us at 1-800-706-0318. If you want to be on our show, feel free to email or call. And if you have a topic, feel free to email or call as well. Thanks for listening to Unpause Your Life. 
For show notes and more, head on over to unpauseyourlife.com. Big shout out to recoveryinnovators.com for help producing this show. Thank you, guys. I took a walk down the long road The weather said that I shouldn't go On my way found a reason To wake up another day But they needed to show you All the things that you won't do Find faith or religion But nothing to show for it No need to Down the dark road Where they said that I shouldn't go I knew the dangers of flying Now I'm so far from silent ground But they needed to show you All the things that you won't do Find faith or religion But nothing to show for Give me something that's just not so hard.